Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Visual Emerging Low Voice series. And together with us in the Visual Campus, we have the pleasure today to host Michelle Hughes, the doctoral candidate in the London School of Economics and a former US Army with over 40 years of expertise and experience in armed conflicts and war zones. And along these lines, Michelle, welcome first of all to Visual here on campus. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And we're going to start with your practical experience of being in conflict zones. So your PhD speaks about the art of war and you can tell us a bit also about the full title. Yeah. And my quest, first question is, do you think that war can be tagged as a piece of art? And if it was a song or a painting, why would you portray war? Well, so first of all, Simone, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be part of this series. I've enjoyed it myself on YouTube. So I'm thrilled to be interviewed today. Um, I love your question about the art of war, mainly because I'm an artist. Um, and I think it's kind of a funny connotation for someone like me who's coming from a background first in the military and then later as a human rights lawyer who's worked in conflict. I, I, I have run into this question a lot about what do you mean when you talk about the art of war? And in fact, the art of war is a very classical understanding of war fighting and what is referred to in modern operational doctrine as operational art. And it refers to the confluence of politics, law, culture, discipline, technical skills, tactics, strategies, um, and everything that goes into a successful military operation. And the concept itself is generally thought of as dating back to Sun Tzu, so it's a very ancient concept. And profession, uh, military professionals study the art of war as a way to look at what is it going to require to combine civilian and military authority and resources in order to win on the battlefield. And so when I was framing my PhD thesis, I was really struggling this, with this idea of, uh, was it possible for Western liberal democracies to be compliant with the increasing strength of international human rights and still win on the battlefield? Um, I hadn't thought about this much back during my military career, which mainly took place in the 1980s and early 90s. But later as a civilian lawyer, as I was working in conflict alongside security forces, be they intelligence, police, or military, I, I would see how human rights agendas or human rights constraints impacted the decisions that commanders were making. In other words, the law, as it was evolving in human rights, was impacting the art of war or the application of operational art. And I wanted to explore that. Michelle, you already uh, speak now, you enter us into the whole chapter of the conjunction uh, and the relationship between the human rights law and the laws of war. And the International Court of Justice, we know already from 2004, has said in the world opinion that in essence, even in cases of armed conflict, uh, human rights law, law should apply in global, in totality. Uh, do you think that we can adhere to this opinion given to the specificities that pertain to combat zones or we should speak about a more nuanced approach towards any human rights application in uh, wartime scenarios? Well, nuance is the right word to use there. I think absolutely for those states that are committed to the idea of international human rights and the principles behind them, that commitment extends to their militaries and how they, in ideal terms, uh, want to be able to fight their wars. And increasingly, of course, what we see in modern times, and we're seeing it you know, in the conflicts today, is that human rights compliance uh, itself is becoming almost a subject of, of, war, of the war. It's part of controlling the narrative. Um, this concept of lawfare, for example, that has really come to the fore in the last 20 years has been, re has been preeminent. And so I don't think that the two ideas work, are in opposition with one another. In fact, international humanitarian law 
is predicated on the idea of human rights. Um, but what I've observed as I've been doing my work, and principally when I'm in the field, I'm involved either in advising security forces on how to connect their security operations to the rest of the rule of law system, justice and governance. Um, or alternatively, I'm working directly to help build security forces that are rule of law compliant. Or alternatively, I'm looking at how we can connect security operations to the advancement of the rule of law. And what I've seen in this process, I'm working with so many different members and organizations in the international community, is that there's become this tendency to put human rights agendas into the military operational objectives. Um, a really good example of that is uh, the gender, uh, the women, peace, and security agenda in Afghanistan and the way in which gender goals and objectives were incorporated into the military mission itself. Um, principally, this was in the form of ensuring uh, at least some form of gender opportunity within Afghan security forces. All three of them, you know, all three arms, the military, uh, the police, and the intelligence services. And I w this was such a priority. Uh, it meant that when we were building the Afghan National Police, for example, there were literally quotas on the recruitment of women into those forces. But what hadn't been thought through very well was uh, the cultural constraints on doing that, the willingness of women to actually, of qualified women, to actually go into those forces, and the protection of women once they got in there. And so with all of this focus on inclusion, we were really forgetting about what it was we were trying to do, which was in a very short period of time, build a very large security sector. So the solution, according to what you're saying now, is maybe give more time to transitional societies in order to build up according to Western human rights standards, their own forces or their own society. So more, more time, isn't it a matter of time or it's a matter also of other considerations? Yeah, I think it's a matter of multiple considerations. And time is absolutely one. And not just the idea of time, but the idea of sequencing. At what point do you make this a priority? Is this an upfront priority? Meaning, it, as we're trying to build an, an organization, a new institution from scratch, we're gonna start right off the bat and ensure that it is inclusive. Um, maybe in that context, which was a highly kinetic counterinsurgency operation, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. Culturally, does it take more time? Was this Western notion of what an inclusive security force looks like, was it appropriate in the Afghan cultural context, particularly coming out of you know, over a decade of Taliban control. The, the same applies, do you think, also in the case of democracy and yeah. the Middle East? Yeah, and I didn't used to think that way. Um, and it's not just in the Middle East. I've worked in about 24 different conflict countries around the world. And I used to, particularly back when I was a young military officer, I was absolutely devoted to the idea of democratization. To me, that was the only way. And later, as a lawyer, um, actually I, I did about nine years as a trial lawyer in a U.S. international law firm when I was doing multinational litigation, and I started to really work with different legal systems and different notions of representative government. And so I started to frame this idea of, well, maybe democracy is not always appropriate in every context, um, at least in the way we think about it. Maybe it's a very Western notion that we're imposing. But I really started to come to this thinking as I was working in a number of countries in Africa and then of course later in the Middle East and in Afghanistan and I was seeing the struggle the, where you have Western interventionists or Western interveners, interventionist is a bad word, um, but Western interveners um, who are advising and assisting very nascent democracies, and they're making this assumption that 
democratic principles that we've all lived with and evolved with, you know, over centuries, and certainly in my own, in the case of my own country, um, are would just automatically take hold in a very natural way. And that doesn't always work in systems that are more accustomed to different customary or traditional ways of allocating power. And so I think in that case, we definitely move too fast too soon. And I also feel like we're very insensitive to some of these other cultural norms. And also we should specialize in comparative constitutional law. So my question is now we are talking about any future agreements maybe between former warring parties. Do you think there should be part of any constitution of that area that is actually entering any phase of its existence? Or maybe soft law documents should be preferred over the entrenchment of any agreements inside the constitution? Well, again, um, there's not a clear yes or no answer to that. Uh, again, it's all contextual. I am a great believer in the power of constitutions. I'm a bigger believer in the power of constituent processes. And one of the ones that I had direct experience with was when I was working in Colombia in 1990 and 91. And at the time I was working there, Colombia was suffering through three active insurgencies and had two of the world's largest and most dangerous drug cartels. And really the entire Colombian constitutional system, and this is South America, this is Latin America's oldest constitutional democracy. Um, and this whole system was under threat. It was under, it was literally under siege. And one of the things that the Colombians did, in addition to stepping up all of their military and police operations, is uh, they initiated an organic Colombian or a constitutional reform process. And the main um, outcome of that process was to create an inclusive process that would allow some of the insurgents, some of the guerrilla groups, to join in, to rejoin the political process. And I wrote an article, I published an article on this uh, a year ago in the LSE Working Papers that's uh, shortly to be a chapter in another book. And I really looked at this from the perspective of today. And what I saw was that the conditions, uh, the, the constituent process and the inclusivity of that combined with the transitional provisions that were put into the new Colombian constitution in 91 enabled the 2016 peace agreement with the FARC, which was the Colombian government's lead adversary. And ironically, now Colombia's current president was a former FARC guerrilla. That would never have happened without that organic constituent process. And what was so interesting about that process is that you had a lot of Western countries um, that wanted to advise the Colombian government on what needed to be in that constitution. And the government took this back off approach. They said, this is ours. We have to make this work. And it wasn't just the state itself. It was civil society organizations and academics and judges. Uh, the Colombian Supreme Court had a big hand in allowing the process itself to move forward because argue, arguably the constituent process they chose violated the previous Colombian constitution. All this presupposes, all this process presupposes we're talking about a country which has a rich social legal tradition. Yeah. Other countries in other areas of the world may not have the same lack of fortune that Colombia had to have also passed to each of uh, legal institutions in order to be able to beget also jurisprudence and to beget a judicial intervention. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great point because that was certainly an asset for Colombia and its tradition, its pride in being Latin America's oldest democracy um, was a very big part of its motivation for sticking with a constituent process that at times was heavily contested. But I would argue, just based on my experience, I don't think I've ever worked in any country that didn't have some kind of form of um, power or resource allocation and some tradition of how power is out, political power is allocated that you can't draw on in the same way. 
The problem that we have when we in the West go into these countries is we don't see that. It's, it's, it's opaque to us because a lot of times it's manifested in institutions or in processes that are unfamiliar to us or that in some cases, such as I saw in Afghanistan, for example, we're not comfortable with. So it's important what you say, we have to open our eyes to be more inclusive also towards other cultures, other civilizations. And Michelle, we spoke, you spoke before about the junction between military and police functions that the army sometimes has to undertake. Uh, do you think that the police functions, that especially in prolonged occupations, or in Afghanistan we saw it also, uh, the US Army had to take policing actions, also in Iraq, uh, how much pertinent are there to the structure of the army? And uh, if there is an alternative other than the army undertaking these operations? That's actually a tough question. So I'll use Afghanistan um, as an example on this. I don't like to always talk about Afghanistan, but we tried a lot of things there. And so it actually makes a very relevant case study for almost any question you want to ask. So initially, the development of a policing capability in Afghanistan and the development of a military capability were two completely separate and apart um, lines of effort, if you will. And the policing effort was principally advised, um, directed, overseen, and funded on the civilian side by civilian police officers um, and, or, and by diplomats and you know, international policing, policing experts. And the military took care of the military. And that's the usual delineation. So a couple of things happened. Um, one was as the insurgency in Afghanistan increased and the level of violence increased, the police forces that were being developed by civilian police were not capable of handling the level of threat. And they were literally just being decimated. Um, the second thing was, was that the insurgency itself and the war itself was, was very hybrid. It was a combination of military problems and law enforcement problems. And those necessitated a unified response. And by developing police forces and military forces along two separate lines, um, there was no, what I would call in U.S. terms, there was no interagency process within the Afghan system at least at that point, that could ensure coordination between the two, that could make the linkages. So in 2009, a decision was made that they would unify all of the security force development under a NATO command. And that was controversial because there was also a very mature European police development mission on the ground. And so what the NATO command did is it uh, joined up or linked up and started coordinating with the two major police development missions that were already in country, um, principally the German um, police uh, development mission because Germany was the lead nation for the development of Afghan police and the UPOL mission. And uh, the NATO command worked very hard to synchronize everything it was doing with the objectives, the long-term objectives of those two development activities. The other thing they did is, in fact we did, because I got to uh, help run the donor conference for this, is we went to the European Union and other NATO allies and we said we need a very large contingent of civilian police, particularly high-end policing such as gendarmerie forces um, and carabinieri, and we need a large contingent of these to actually be embedded in the NATO mission to guide you couldn't get the numbers of those that you could have with, you know, uniform military forces, but you could set them alongside military forces as the technical advisors to oversee and guide the development mission. It wasn't a perfect fit. Uh, I'll be honest, it wasn't. But the Afghan National Police made a tremendous amount of progress in their development between 2009 and 2012 with this particular system. There were points in that where I, as someone who had at that point done about 20 years worth of international development,
there were points at which I was seeing all of the indicators of sustainable capacity building. So you say here that it's important also for the local societies to actually retain their own police forces in order to be able to, uh, to help any armies that are being stationed in a particular territory. They must. I mean, they have to work out their own interagency and their own civil military coordination process. And the other thing that's absolutely critical is they themselves have to work out what the linkage is between security forces and the rest of the rule of law system. And again, you know, we have great models for that. Um, the OECD and its comprehensive uh, framework for security system reform is an excellent model for doing that. But it all has to be contextualized. It has to fit within the local idea of what is the continuum from security to justice. And this is what I want now to touch upon, Michelle, this continuum from security to justice, in the sense that you have also written a very interesting volume about transition from the conflict to a more peaceful society. Do you think it's more difficult to handle the actual wartime scenarios or the transitional scenarios? Use in bello or use post bellum, as we say in Latin, for all our viewers also here? Yeah, I think absolutely the use post bellum is the difficult part. Um, the book that I did uh, together with my co-editor and co-author was called Impunity, um, Countering Illicit Power and War in Transition. And what we did is we looked at um, about 50 different countries around the world over uh, a period of approximately 50 years. And we selected around 20 of them to be case studies to look at how countries, um, how, do, how do you, to ask this question of how do you deal with illicit power structures, whether they're militias, insurgents, transnational criminal organizations, um, other spoiler, other organized armed group spoilers. And we were looking to see if we could find some commonalities, some trends, um, some common factors that allowed them to arise and common factors that allowed states that were emerging from conflict or traumatic political transition to address these. And it was a really fascinating project. I mean, I learned a tremendous amount because we went out to write our case studies for us. We went out to experts from all around the world to try to find people who had firsthand knowledge with these and academics who had studied some of these phenomena and these particular conflicts deeply. Um, so it was pretty exciting, but it also showed me that while there are in fact commonalities and we need to recognize and identify those, um, it also showed me just how intractable the problem of illicit power is. And it's very interesting what you say because it's a more general problem. It doesn't constrain itself only to um, scenarios, you say it goes also in the criminal world. And uh, what are the conclusions of your uh, research, the main conclusions of this volume? Well, one of my big takeaways from it, and uh, one that I use in my teaching all the time, the first thing I say is that illicit networks ride on the backbone of illicit networks. The kinds of organ transnational organizations that we see today, whether you're talking about Hamas or Hezbollah or, or Al-Qaeda um, or the Zetas in Mexico, you know, it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter. They can't function to the level that they are functioning without legitimate systems. Um, and so you really have to take a look at the intersection between um, illicit structures and illicit structures and start to pick them apart. And of course, high-end high law enforcement agencies have you know, come to this conclusion long before the rest of us did. Um, but they haven't really put it in any kind of unified doctrine. Um, and so we wanted to try to do that in a way that would speak not only to the law enforcement problem, but also speak to military forces who are going into these hybrid conflicts where they are running into not into both state and non-state adversaries and they're trying to understand how it is that some of these particularly transnational non-state actors are impacting the battle space and why they can't just focus on the military problem. Um, one of my big takeaways back in my early days as an army intelligence officer, I worked in 
uh, Central America doing counterinsurgency for a while, and then of course Colombia um, doing counter narcotics. And one of the reasons I went to law school uh, was because it was very clear to me that there was no military solution to the problems that I had been dealing with as a military officer. And so in a way, um, the book Impunity was coming full circle for me in that it was a way to study that phenomenon and then look at what kind of combined comprehensive approach it takes in order to counter these really destructive power, power structures. When you speak before about legitimate systems, you mean financial systems or political systems? Uh, it's financial, political, transportation, communication, frankly, education systems. Um, you know, you name it, you pick a system out there that is part of a governmental structure, that's part of a functioning state, and that is part of the network that illicit power structures will then use and leverage for their own ends. So you're talking about scenarios where the state itself is like the harboring of terrorism we had with Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda, where the state itself wants to endorse in its uh, embrace uh, this particular uh, non-state actor. You're not talking about a scenario where maybe the main state, the main government negates the existence of this non-state actor in its realms. I think what I'm really talking about is whether a state is um, complicit or not complicit, you know, deliberately or not, whether, you know, for corrupt reasons or, or power sharing or whatever, um, you know, or other political reasons. What I'm talking about is it's inevitable that it's going to happen. And so when you're looking at how to strengthen governance structures, um, one of my big, the big, another big conclusion that I've come to both in my research and in my work is that you have to build in accountability mechanisms right from the very beginning. Before you begin to empower people, before you begin to hire anyone, you actually need to have some semblance of a formal system that ensures merit-based hiring, for example. Um, this issue of corruption and influence, you know, and, and improper influence, um, and patronage is it's destructive to everything you do and not only is it destructive to the system to the governmental system itself but it creates all of these openings for bad actors be they military criminal other types of civilian or non-state actors it creates these openings for them to get into the system and to the formal system and use it and you have to shut those down before they even exist. You said you speak very correctly, there are no easy solutions regarding the building of a country and of course regarding the conduct of warfare. I would like to ask about the very much studied and spoken proportionality principle in warfare, the use in Bello proportionality principle as it's known to ask the people who actually research about the laws of war. And the question is, uh, what's the, we're talking about the balance between the military necessity mm -hmm. and uh, the civilian injury. Uh, do you think that this balance is purely uh, mathematical or it can have also qualitative features? Meaning, if somebody uh, believes that uh, the state, the army, is after a high profile combatant, enemy combatant, mm -hmm. how many, do we have a number of how many civilians can be actually uh, killed and uh, in order for the whole operation to be deemed legal, of course, to be killed as collateral damage, not intentionally. Yeah. Or it's not a matter of numbers, meaning the high seniority of the target, does it change the number of the civilians that law can sustain as a collateral damage? So here's where my current project um, has the potential to become incredibly controversial. And I almost wish you wouldn't ask me about proportionality because I hate to be put on the record on this in the current environment. You can tell us what you want to say. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's important. Freedom of choice. But it's important that we talk about this. Um, and it's so important that we talk about this. So there's definitely been a movement to try to, um, to, try to quantify proportionality how many civilian deaths or, or injuries are enough, how much property damage is too much. Um, I think the correlation of war study uh, put a number on it in non-international conflict of like a thousand or something like that. 
Um, but that makes no sense in the battle space. It, it simply doesn't make any sense. It's always contextual. And my concern is, and this goes back to one of my motivations for the research that I'm doing, I'm looking at the intersection between uh, international human rights and the art of war. My concern is, is that in focusing on numbers in the short term, we or focusing on certain other rights agendas, not just right to life, but others in the short term, we're losing sight of why are we even fighting at all? If we're not out there to win, then we shouldn't be fighting. Now, that doesn't mean military necessity trumps everything because legally it doesn't, it's a factor. Um, it doesn't mean it's everything in the be all end all because there are ways within military tactics and strategies that you can absolutely limit the collateral effect. But you have to be really creative about those and you have to be incredibly knowledgeable about those. This is where the art of war comes in. I hear talk all the time, everywhere I've worked, I have worked with really well-intentioned human rights advocates and international lawyers and others who will say, well, they shouldn't have used that munition against that target. That was too much. Or why did they have to use so much force? Or they should have warned these people beforehand. Or they should have moved them out of the way. Or they shouldn't have run that operation. Um, or that tactic was inappropriate. Okay, fine. You get in that room and you look at what's available and who has the legal authorization to use some of the munitions that are available and what's on site or you know even geographically possible um, and what's known and unknown in the intelligence and you try to make that assessment because it's not nearly as straightforward as it seems. And I'll use a, an example from the war in ISIS, a targeting example. So <clears throat> you have, say, special for it, let's just say for the sake of argument, you've got special forces on the ground and they have located and positively identified an ISIS cell that is planning an operation in a building. They don't know who's in that building other than the 20 or so ISIS fighters, but they're pretty sure that there aren't any civilians. But they can't get in there to find out. You, they can't see in, contrary to popular belief. This is not the Bourne Identity movies. Um, so they can't see in, but they're pretty sure. So they call in this target. They've been after this cell for a long time. It's been creating death and destruction all around um, certain Yazidi villages in this particular case. So they call in the target. The target gets examined from far away. It gets vetted against strategic intelligence that perhaps they're not seeing on the ground. And it seems to be as they are reporting it. It looks to be the right thing. Well, what's the next step? Okay, let's do a surgical airstrike on it. Standoff capability. Well, then you get to this question of, well, who can do that? What aircraft are flying in the area at this time that can reach that target before those fighters disperse? What munitions would be most appropriate? And there will be this big legal debate. And they'll say, all right, the minimum amount of munition that we can use will be this. But the aircraft that's circling around, that's near enough to, do the, to fire, doesn't carry that munition. Or maybe that munition is not in that theater of operation. Maybe it's in short supply. Or maybe you're in a, you, the available aircraft is a coalition aircraft that's not authorized to carry that particular munition. Do you see how difficult it gets? I mean, and this is just the technical stuff. So when I hear this blithe soundbite of they use too much force, or why didn't they, you know, act 
then and not now, or now and not then, or, you know, why didn't they use this tactic? Why did they, why did they um, use a drone strike and not just send in, uh, you know, make it like a police operation? Um, there are a lot of factors that go into that why. Michelle, how much do you think that these military considerations are being taken into account by international courts more specifically by the International Criminal Court, which is going also to open cases, as open cases also in wartime scenarios. And how much, if not, if they're not being taken into account, how much should these courts take into account these military considerations you explain right now? So I can't really speak to the ICC um, because frankly, they just haven't pursued enough cases. So we're not, we, re we really haven't seen enough. Um, despite how long they've been in existence, to get a real feel for how good they are at taking these considerations into account. Um, I have studied an awful lot of cases in Europe, particularly in the European Court of Human Rights and certain domestic cases. And what I'm beginning to see is a lot of confusion amongst the justices about what probably 50 years ago, would have been much more settled principles of international humanitarian law. There seems to be a great deal of confusion about what these principles actually mean in practice. And it's not, I think, because of any desire to not get it right, or because of a lack of academic work, because there's certainly enough of that. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that for the most part, you no longer have a significant percentage of governments, policymakers, judges, lawyers, and others who have military experience. Almost no one has ever served. And so there's, this, there's a bit of military illiteracy that's going on. And Michelle, the last question is about, in essence, uh, your uh, actually private work that you did after you actually left the army. Yeah. Uh, you had also a company, and mm -hmm. you still have a company. Or I you still can, do. You still have the company. It's kind of shelved. So it's, on, it's on hiatus right now. So the question is, how easy is it for the private individual to enter this strategy consulting scheme, and how wishable it is? Well, it's not easy to enter, uh, to have your own consultancy. Mine is in rule of law development. It's not easy to do that. Um, you have to be known, you have to have a reputation. Um, you know, people have to trust you. you. You basically have to be connected with the system. And almost everyone who does this work at one point or another has served with their governments. And I've served both as a military officer, but also later as a senior official in both the Bush and Obama administrations. Um, the, the privatization of international development writ large is pretty well documented and rule of law development, which is what I do, um, is, is no exception. It's very rare that you're on the ground and the people you're working with who are doing advising to government officials or security organizations, the real experts, it's very rare that they themselves are government officials. They will be supervised by government officials, they will be funded by governments or international organizations, um, but the real experts are gonna be private consultants who have been brought in. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Michelle Hughes with us today in this episode of the BUL Emerging Law Voices series. Thank you very much for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you.